foodie film producer now. He's trying to put these experiences on film and convey it to a world that hasn't been exposed to that. Now, in terms of his program, uh, if you saw in, on, on the webpage, it says uh, horsing around in Mongolia. Okay, that's another part of the world, and uh, I want to let him explain what horsing around in Mongolia means. Uh, Mongolia has probably one of the world's most uh, resourceful places for treasured horses, and that's their lifestyle and not down festivals and all that. So TJ, if I didn't take your program away, which I'd love to speak for two hours on you, if you would join us here today and give us a program. TJ Horse. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, great introduction here. I'll uh, give you $10 after I'm done. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be back here with you. Uh, I want to thank my brother for helping me put the uh, technical side together. And uh, we'll get started here. It should be about a little bit over an hour. I hope I don't take up uh, too much of your evening. And <clears throat> we'll begin here. Let me get the uh, computer going. Uh, is it on? No, okay. We have a lot of ground to cover this evening, and uh, after each segment, I'll stop. And if you'd like to ask questions, feel free to do so. If you can't wait, go ahead and holler it out, and I'll do my best to reply to you. Um, I mentioned before my friend Janice has joined us here this evening. She has encouraged me over the years to get my PhD. She's a professor at USC, and I say to her, well, Janice, well, what am I going to write on anyways? And she says to me, well, you've already traveled so much, you already got the practical part finished. Uh, well, if that's the case, uh, consider tonight a defense of my dissertation. <laughs> so, um, you've had time here, this is where we'll begin. The red line you can see is uh, my land travels from July 2010 to March 2011. Probably familiar with uh, most of you. And then I flew on to Bangkok, not knowing what else to do with myself. Five years ago, I was bored out of my skull and I didn't know what to do. I started thumbing through a local course catalog of a, of a junior college here. And I found a course I knew nothing about, which of course you're thinking uh, that's not hard to do. The course was horseology. So I signed up and put my rear in the saddle for a few hours, quit my job in Berlin, uh, and bought a ticket to Mongolia where you can buy a horse for cheaper than you can ride a horse for one hour here in LA. So I thought that's the place for me. So I went to horseback riding here in Hofskold province with a Spaniard I met on Lonely Planet. Oh, do we have a pointer? Is this it? Yes. And what do you do with it? Too? Down here, I'm oh, sorry, down here is the city of Moron. We arrived there, bought two horses apiece with a tack and with one guide. We rode up here four days to the city of Renchel Kumbe. And you get to Renchel Kumbe, and what do you hear? You hear, hey, have you seen the Satan people? Satan are an ethnic group, nomadic, live in teepees, raise reindeer, and they have shamanism. And when you hear that, you, the only thing you could say is, let's go. <laughs> so we did go, and that's this mark right here, two days out and two days back. The other line you see here is where I solo trekked with my horse 10 days down here. Uh, by the way, those are the 10 best days of my life. <clears throat> if you've done any horse trekking, probably you uh, agree with me that a pack horse is not the way to go. You don't want a pack horse. Pack horses are nothing but trouble. Here we're taking a break. Pack horses uh, get scared, they run away, they stop when they want, they go when they want. Big pain. The satan, as I say, they move around, so you have to ask where where they are. And this 
couple drove up on their motorcycle and said, go west, young men, and so we did. This was uh, about the 10th of August, and already it's getting late in the season, huh? The winter's impending, and <coughs> horses know best uh, that it's dangerous, huh? Um, yeah. Here you can see the haystacks. Horses are feeding machines. This one's mine here, taking a bite. And what's it like to ride a horse? Well, here's a little idea. We found another horse, horse train going, bringing in supplies for the miners. So we hooked up with them. How do you hold that camera that stood here? The left hand's really strong with the, on the reins. Do you have a, a steady tracker or something like that? What? No, I had a Canon 70, far too heavy for this. It's uh, yeah. I wouldn't wow. recommend it. And wow. the guide uh, saw a white speck on the horizon, and indeed, we found the stop time. There's the teepee, the reindeer. We stayed in this teepee a couple days. Would have loved to have stayed longer. Uh, this is the boy, and he lives with his mom here. I imagine the husband's out on the hunt or so. I'm not really sure. We were obliged to make a nominal purchase of some antler carvings. This is inside the teepee. And what happens now? A few scenes of Satan life. Some of you know the three sports of Mongolia are horseback riding. <laughs> Here they're practicing uh, on their reindeer. Archery, and the third is wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> In Mongolia, they keep livestock, and that's their livelihood. And no matter what you keep, be it reindeer, goat, horse, or cattle, you milk it. Oops. That was the last one, and we go on to the next one. So, August 11th, what do you have? You have a snowstorm. Next day was worse, yeah. <laughs> Here the woman's preparing this tea. Can you give us an approximation of uh, altitude and latitude? Oh, I think you guys could probably do much better than I could. Uh, I'd rather not say anything. I'm going to be so far off the mark. <laughs> You're not going to let me be a member, man. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Um, the next day, the blizzard came through, and our guide said, pack your horses, and what are you going to do? Um, we tried to get out of it. We wanted to stay there longer, but he wanted to go. And you can see it's nearly a whiteout. But he found a trail back to Rancho Cumbe. And here's what Rancho Cumbe looks like when we returned. It looks like that from this angle. How about from yours? <laughs> Were you the only Westerner? I don't see any trees around. That's why I'm not <laughs> so here, here again is Rancho Cumbe. And we rode up to Saganor. Oh, now we don't have any more um, our guides. Just me and the Spaniard. And so we're, we're on our own. 
Back then, we had no GPS. We had a compass. We had uh, paper maps. And we also had the electricity poles. So that's how you go from one town to the other, is you follow the wires. Or, <laughs> if that's too hard for you, you just follow the road. It's really not that difficult. You might wonder a little bit now and then where you are and which direction you're going. We came to this gear, or yurt. Uh, I'll come back to this one in a few moments. And just north of there is a shaman's house. And of course, what are you going to do? You go by a shaman's house, you knock on the door, and you go on in and see what's happening. And there was a newlywed couple there, and they wanted to see what's happening too. So here's what happened. for a while about that one. Uh, here you can see the shaman changing his clothes. He's coming out of his trance, so to speak, now, and when he puts on the, his Mongolian hat, he's uh, back in civvies. Okay, um, now I come back to Otgon, the woman here with her two of her daughters. She has two more daughters. This woman here is, uh, this girl here is 14. She has a twin. This one here is four, and she has an older daughter, 16 years old. The husband is off on a three-day hunt. You can see in the background uh, the yurt, the gear where they live, and they also have um, a solid construction. Believe it or not, they come back here every summer. This is their summer holiday. They live in Rancho Cumbe. She's a teacher. He was an electrician. And, um, you know, it's not like they've been doing this their whole, whole life. They, they have professions, just like you, you and me. And it's a summertime in the, in the steppe. So you can see they have their solar panel from China. They have their motorcycle from China. And they, I don't know where the battery's from. Yeah, let's see if we can make this a little bit bigger for you. The curious thing about the gear is that the layout is all the same. You can go in a, a hundred of them and they'll all be the same. You have the door right here. In the middle, you have the stove. The right-hand side is the side of the family. The left-hand side is the side for the guests. Over here, you have the kitchen. Here, you have the bed. Opposite the door is the family shrine. It's amazing that the uh, culture of photography they have. Everybody has albums of their ancestors and their, their relatives. And over here you have another bed. Usually this is here where I slept. And when I brought in my saddle and my cap, it goes right here. They, they had actual beds? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you sleep on the floor, you can use the blankets that you put underneath your saddle, and it's really comfortable. Here we have a sample of a Mongolian saddle. It's made of wood construction here, with a little bit of padding. I didn't ride on this kind, I rode on a Russian saddle. It has a metal, and it's uh, padded more. Like I said, if you have um, livestock, you milk it. And here the family comes back from a round of milking. These kids go to any kind of school? 
Yeah, like I said, this is a now summer summer vacation, and um, in Rancho Cumbe they go to school. Can you speak with them? Well, I had my I had my um, Lonely Planet Mongolian phrase book, <laughs> and after a while, you can put it together uh, rudimentary sentences, and that is actually the reason that I returned to this gear because my partner left my phrase book in this at Orkun's house. And I wasn't going to travel without my phrase book, so I returned there, and it was a blessing in disguise because it was uh, four days of beautiful, beautiful time. So once you got the milk, what do you do with it? Make it taste. Yeah, the saying goes, uh, today's milk is tomorrow's yogurt is the next day's cheese. Bear in mind, they have dairy products, they have meat, and almost no vegetables. And they also have wheat products. So here they are now uh, slicing their cheese. And once you got the cheese sliced, you put it out in the sun to dry. I rode with this cheese. Um, it didn't last forever, however. It lasted maybe a week before it started uh, getting moldy. And as I mentioned, uh, they have wheat products. They bake their own bread. They make their own pasta and noodle soup. And before I say goodbye to uh, Otgon and Mongolia, I'd like to show you what I call Mongolian magic. It's a short video clip that I filmed maybe from 6 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock. Just a couple hours. I think it took place every day, but I was usually too naive to know what was going on. So let's see what we got here.
Yeah, I hope I was able to convey <laughs> the reason why I call it Mongolian magic. That still gives me goosebumps. I mean, for five years ago till today, when I when I think of those days, just those moments, it was simply incredible for me. Um, that's the end of the Mongolian segment. If you have any further questions, sir. Is there an outhouse near the girds? Yeah. Um, the people are semi-nomadic. They build uh, permanent structures like you saw in the log cabin. They have a corral, and they have a toilet. Yeah. Sir, sorry. Do they use, uh, I'm sure they have wolves and, and predators. Do they use dogs to keep them away from the livestock? Yeah, the, um, dogs can be a problem. They weren't so much for me, but I've heard that Yeah, everybody has a dog, and it's usually chained up outside, and they bark like crazy when you arrive. Scene where the young girl was pouring milk to become yogurt. It looked like a sister sitting down. It looked like a cell phone. Yeah, that's right. They had cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> What's even more curious, after I left Mongolia, I found out that sometimes, believe it or not, to catch the signal, they throw it into the air and to send their messages. <laughs> okay. We'll move on then. Uh, what do we got here? Let's, what do I got to do? I think you went to sleep. Yeah. Waking up? Yeah. Okay. So from Mongolia, I took the train to the border. I think then you take a taxi into Beijing. And once you're in Beijing, you have to go visit the Great Wall. I went to Jinshan Ling. Now the thing about the Great Wall, you want to take the pictures of the sunset, right? Well, that's easy. You know, the bus gets there in the afternoon, you hang out, you take photos of the sunset. But what about the sunrise? How are you going to get the sunrise? The sunrise is hard to get. You know, sunrise is 6 a.m. or so. There ain't no bus, man. But there's an easy way to get around that. And I call that camping the Great Wall. <laughs> it's illegal, but it's fun. <laughs> so you find yourself a watchtower, better if it has a roof in case it rains, and you set up camp for, for the night. But as it got darker and darker, it became more and more eerie for me because I heard voices, and I wasn't alone, and I knew that two weeks prior, two Japanese tourists had been detained, and I was thinking, well, maybe this is my turn. <clears throat> this is my watchtower. Uh, so I finally went to sleep. Made myself at home there. The sun rose the next day. All my worry, of course, was for naught because the other people weren't the police. They were photographers doing the same thing I was doing, trying to get a shot of the sun, sunrise. What year was that wall built, approximately? Yeah, hey, I know this one. I looked it up. Um, the first emperor of China. Can you help me with his name, Qin Chang Huang? I think 200 years before Christ contributed. I don't know if he was the first one, but he may have been the first one to begin the wall. His name will crop up later in uh, in a moment. So the year. The year exactly? 250 BC. Oh, any, qu any more questions about the wall? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go for it, man. <laughs> Did the design change over the years? Wow. Um, that's beyond you my were pay there. That's beyond my pay grade. Right <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Smart. Smart. I have a question and answer Please. about the shaman, what your impression was. Oh, yeah. Um... You know, I have a close family member who communes with spirits. And I don't know what to make of this. 
and you ask me about shamanism, you can ask me about my sister. I don't know. The evidence is not so compelling yet for me. And I, one of my hobbies when I go on the road is to go to the psychics and see what they have to say. You know, it's much better, much more interesting than movies. You know, they tell stories, and I have a story then to tell too. But so far, I've been to a dozen of them. Some of them are interesting. The most interesting one was right here in Los Angeles. But uh, the other ones are 50-50 at best. What was so interesting about the one here? He said some things that could be interpreted as possibly being true. Did I hedge my bets enough on that one? <laughs> <laughs> So from uh, Beijing, I headed down to Dengfeng, which is uh, where you'll find Shaolin Chi, Shaolin Temple, the birthplace of Zen Buddhism, and to my understanding, Kung Fu. In this, in this area surrounding Shaolin Temple, you got a cottage industry of martial arts schools. It's really, really popular here. People, you know, the parents send their kids to learn martial arts. You'll see people doing that without the technological devices. Now these exercises may look kind of basic, but when you're 50 years old um, and you get home in the evening, your knees are swollen. Uh, okay. So I decided to sign up for a couple weeks and uh, see how much my knees would swell up. <laughs> and here we have a uh, practice between two of the best in my group. I don't know the name of the city, but it's in the province, or maybe Deng Feng, D-E-N-G-F-E-N-G. -E -E now, Kung Fu takes on a whole new look when the master takes his break. <laughs> 